It's the Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters finale. Pharaoh at 10 versus Yugi Moto. The Pharaoh must be defeated in order to return his soul to the afterlife. And the only one capable of doing this is Yugi. Both duelists decide to split the deck that they have accumulated throughout the entire series in half. And with the spaces left in their deck, they will add their own cards to it, unique to them. After a fierce and dramatic duel, ultimately Yugi takes the victory with tears in his eyes. The Pharaoh's soul is set free and Yugi is now the new and true King of Games. Today, we're going to be analysing the entire 26 turn duel. And what we're going to figure out is if Yugi really did earn this win, was he playing the best possible duel he could? We also want to find out if Atem held back in any way. And finally, let's see if there's any shenanigans in this duel. Any, I don't think you're allowed to do that moments. Without further ado, let's jump into the duel. The duel begins and Atem goes first. He draws and his opening hand consists of the tricky Guy the Fierce Knight, Obelisk the Tormentor, Bounce Spell, Summoning Clock, and Card of Sanctity. Atem activates the effect of the Tricky. By discarding one card, he can special summon it straight to the field. He discards Swift Gaia and then sets his quick play Bounce Spell face down on the field and then ends his turn. Right off the bat, I have to say this, would it have hurt Atem to set Summoning Clock face down as well, just in case he needed it? Also, if he would have done that, that meant he would have had two cards in his hand. And one of these cards is Card of Sanctity. So if he would have activated that, he would have drew five new cards. He would now have Obelisk the Tormentor in his hand, Rebellion, Tricky Spell 4, Mirror Force, Queen's Knight, and King's Knight. He could now set his Mirror Force, and he could use his Tricky Spell to get four Tricky Tokens straight to the field. Next turn, he could summon his Obelisk the Tormentor, Atem, you've misplayed here. It's Yugi's turn, and he draws. His opening hand consists of Swords of Revealing Light, Green Gadget, Stronghold the Moving Fortress, Turn Jump, Amber Shield, and Ground Erosion. Yugi realizes nothing in his hand can get over the tricky, just yet, so decides to activate Swords of Revealing Light. Atem is now unable to attack for three turns. Yugi summons Green Gadget to the field, which, when summoned, triggers its effect to add Red Gadget straight from his deck to his hand. He ends his turn by setting Stronghold the Moving Fortress face down. It's Atem's turn and he draws Rebellion. Atem enters his battle phase and activates his spell Rebellion. This card allows him to choose one monster on the opponent's side of the field and force it to attack from the opponent's side of the field. However, as Green Gadget turns to attack Yugi directly, he counters with his trap Stronghold the Moving Fortress. For its effect, it special summons itself to the field as a trap monster into defense. Now since there is a monster on the field, Green Gadget can't attack directly, so instead it attacks Stronghold. Since Green Gadget attacked from Yugi's side of the field, Yugi takes the damage. Atem ends his turn. It's Yugi's turn and he draws Ties of the Brethren. Yugi plays it straight away. At the cost of 1000 life points, he can target one level 4 monster and special summon two monsters with the same level and type as that chosen monster. He summons his red gadget from his hand along with his yellow gadget from his deck. Neither one of these monsters are allowed to be tributed, or can declare an attack while they remain on the field. However, that's okay, because with all three gadgets on the field, the effect of Stronghold kicks in. Stronghold's attack increases to 3000. Yugi, now on the offensive, switches it to attack and enters his battle phase. As he attempts to attack the Tricky, Atem activates his Bounce spell, which lets him take one face-up spell on Yugi's side of the field, steal it, and then activate it straight away. He chooses Swords of Revealing Light, so now Yugi is the one who can't attack for three more turns. Yugi, now on the defensive, switches his green gadget into defense and ends his turn. It's back to Atem and he draws Tricky Spell 4. He activates it by sending the Tricky to the grave. By doing this, Atem is allowed to special summon a Tricky token for each monster on the opponent's field. However, these tokens cannot attack. Since Yugi controls four monsters, Atem summons four Tricky tokens. He tributes three of them to summon Obelisk the Tormentor. He moves straight into his battle phase and attacks and destroys Stronghold the Moving Fortress. Atem ends by setting Summoning Clock face down. It's Yugi's turn and he draws Silent Swordsman level 0. Yugi sets his Turn Jump, Ambush Shield and Ground Erosion Traps face down. Then he summons his Silent Swordsman into attack. With no cards left in his hand, Yugi ends his turn. It's back to Atem and he draws Mirror Force. He sets it face down to empty his hand, so that when he activates his Card of Sanctity, he can get the full benefit from it. 
Now both players draw until their hand is six. Since both players' hands are empty, both players draw six cards. Atem gets Queen's Knight, King's Knight, Slife of the Sky Dragon, The Winged Dragon of Ra, Pot of Greed, and Book of Secret Arts. While Yugi gets Alpha the Magnet Warrior, Beta the Magnet Warrior, Gamma the Magnet Warrior, Valkyrian the Magna Warrior, Mirage Spell, and Mirage Ruler. Atem enters his battle phase and orders Obelisk to attack Silent Swordsman, attempting to go for game. As he does, Yugi activates his trap, Ground Erosion. And it is here that the first possible shenanigan reveals itself. You see, Atem reminds Yugi that spells and traps don't work on gods. However, Yugi says that this trap doesn't affect Obelisk, but it is instead targeting the ground beneath it. Which I mean, technically, he is right. If we look at the card's effect, it says select one monster card zone on the field. You can send this face-up card to the graveyard to negate the effects of a monster in the selected monster zone and decrease its attack. For every one of your standby phases, this card has been face-up on field. The fact that this thing isn't targeting Obelisk, you can just assume that all the Egyptian gods can't be targeted, right? Since the show made an effort to explain this, we're gonna say it's not a plot hole. We're gonna say it's fine. It's all good. Getting back to it though, Yugi's not done yet. He chains another face down, turn jump. Due to its effect, three turns pass by in an instant. However, unbeknownst to Yugi, Atem has played a trap card of his own, summoning clock. A lot of stuff happens here, so in order of resolution... <clears throat> Summoning Clock gains three turn counters. Obelisk's attack decreases by 1500 due to ground erosion, and also completely negates its effects. Meaning, and this is really important, it can't use its sacrifice ability. It can't sacrifice two monsters to inflict 4000 damage to the opponent, and wipe the opponent's field. Silent Swordsman's attack increases by 1500. Finally, Swords of Revealing Light dissipates since three turns have instantly gone by. With Obelisk weakened, Atem chooses not to attack with him. However, while still in the battle phase, he activates the effect of Summoning Clock. By sending it and one other monster on the field to the graveyard, Atem can special summon monsters from his hand equal to the number of turns that have passed. The monsters summoned don't need cards to be tributed for their summon. I've highlighted that for an important reason, we'll talk about that in a sec. Atem tributes his last tricky token, and then special summons his King's Knight and Queen's Knight from his hand. The effect of King's Knight activates, which also special summons his Jack's Knight from his deck. Finally, with one more summon remaining, Atem special summons Slife of the Sky Dragon to the field, and with three cards left in his hand, Slifer's attack equals 3,000. Yugi very oddly activates his last face down trap, Ambush Shield, which lets him tribute one monster to increase his Silent Swordsman's attack by the tributed monster's defense. But hang on, just a second. Why not wait for attempt to attack with Slifer? That's like obviously what he was going to do. You would have destroyed Slifer and Slifer would have gone to the grave and you'd have dealt a thousand damage to Slifer. What's the deal here? Is this a misplay from Yugi? No, actually. You see, Yugi has a plan. He knows exactly how to defeat all three Egyptian god cards, and even better, he knows how to do it in a single move. What he's trying to do is bring all of the pieces together, and the thing to instigate all of this is Slifer the Sky Dragon. He needs that monster to stay on the field, so that is why he didn't destroy it. Though Slifer can't get over Silent Swordsman, Atem still attacks and destroys the two remaining gadgets with his knights. He then moves to his main phase two. He tributes the three knights and summons the Winged Dragon of Ra. Ra's attack and defense become equal to the sum of the three monsters used for its summon. This totals 5,000 attack and 4,000 defense. Before Atem ends his turn, he activates Pot of Greed to draw two new cards, which are Berthamet and Gazelle. Wait, 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 wait. Did he just use Pot of Greed? He's had Pot of Greed this entire turn. Why didn't he activate it? It would be a big deal, except for the fact he has a monster on the field whose attack is determined by the number of cards in his hand. If he'd have activated this, his Slifer would have had 4,000 attack. And that wouldn't be a big deal, except he would be able to destroy a monster if his attack was 4,000. He could have attacked into Silent Magician, not knowing that Yugi has a face down trap that's gonna boost the monster to 4,000, but it doesn't matter because Silent Swordsman would have been destroyed. That meant that Queen's Knight and King's Knight could have attacked the last two magnets, and now Yugi's field is completely 
empty, and Obelisk the Tormentor and Jax Knight can attack directly for game. Yugi only has 1400 life points left. You can make the argument that Obelisk doesn't have an attack available. A 10 attempted to attack with Obelisk and had to cancel his attack. However, Turn Jump specifically states you go forward three turns and restart on the third turn in that battle phase. So this is technically a new battle phase, so Obelisk should have an attack still. However, it's a bit weird. Perhaps they just moved from that point and went back to that one. So we are going to say that Obelisk can't attack. It doesn't really matter because he's still got a Jax Knight and Jax Knight would have run in the duel by itself. So that means Atem could have won this turn if he'd have played Potter Greed at the start of his turn. Why didn't he? What a fool. Anyway, getting back to the duel, Atem ends his turn. And as he does, the effect of Ambush Shield ends. And wait a minute, aren't we all forgetting something? Egyptian God cards that are special summoned must go to the graveyard during the end phase of the turn they were summoned this way. So, uh, Slifer, what are you doing? Yes, Slifer was supposed to go to the graveyard here since it was special summoned. So why didn't it? This is gonna be a tough plot hole to patch up, but I think I can do it. Remember Summoning Clock, the card that special summons Slifer? Well, in its effect, it specifically states that there is no need to tribute for monsters summoned by this effect. So here we go. Perhaps the reason God cards go to the graveyard is not because they were specifically special summoned, but because they were summoned without any sacrifices. Remember, they are gods, so it makes sense that they require blood sacrifices to enter the mortal realm. If you don't feed them their blood sacrifice, they're either gonna get angry or they're just gonna leave. So with that in mind, since this card states the monster summoned needs no sacrifice, it would be safe to say that this card is acting as a kind of synthetic sacrifice in the place of actual monsters. This is why Slifer didn't go to the grave. It's blood sacrifice cost had been paid synthetically. It didn't know the difference. Okay? Okay. Anyway, it's Yugi's turn, and he is facing three Egyptian god cards. He draws and he receives Magnet Force. Yugi's standby phase occurs and Silent Swordsman's level and attack increases. Yugi sends his Alpha, Beta, and Gamma in his hand to the graveyard in order to special summon his Valkyrion. The effect of Slifer activates, which reduces the attack or defense of the monster summoned by 2000. Yugi activates his quick play spell, Mirage Spell. Its effect is that it can only be activated when the attack or defense of a monster you control would change by an opponent's effect. Gain life points equal to the amount that would have changed instead. Is this possible shenanigans number three? No, I don't think it is. You see, this card is not altering Slifer. It is altering the result of Slifer's effect. This is Slifer's effect. This is Slifer. It's coming in. No one's, no one's touching it, no one's messing with it. It's done what it's supposed to do. And then on this side of the, uh, the legality wall, that gets converted into life points instead of damage. Now, instead of Valkyrian's attack being reduced, Yugi's life points increase. Yugi ends by setting Mirage Ruler and Magnet Force face down. Eagle-eyed viewers might notice here that Yugi could absolutely attack over Obelisk or Slifer. However, we know why he doesn't attack into Slifer, because he has a plan. But could he have attacked into Obelisk? Yes, he absolutely could have. He would have done some damage and it wouldn't really have stopped his ultimate plan. It's a very good job that he didn't, because remember, Atem has Mirror Force face down. Good play, Yugi. We'll let that one go. It's back to Atem and he draws Dark Illusion. Slifer's attack increases to 4,000. Now with enough attack, Atem goes into his battle phase and uses Slifer to destroy Silent Swordsman. The attack is successful and Yugi takes damage. Atem then attacks with Ra, targeting Valkyrion. Valkyrion is also destroyed. Obelisk attempts to go for game. However, Yugi reveals his face down Mirage Ruler, which makes it so all monsters destroyed this turn return back to the field and all damage taken is returned back to how it was. Although, Yugi must pay 1000 life points. Obelisk, unable to get over Valkyrion and Silent Swordsman, is forced to end its battle. A Tem ends his turn. I feel like I'm jumping in a lot with this tool. Technically, in the real world, if Silent Swordsman came back, its attack would go all the way back down to 1000. But it is the anime, so perhaps it comes back how it was when it left the field. It's Yugi's turn, and he's ready to do the impossible. He draws Magnet Reverse. The standby phase occurs and Silent Swordsman moves up to level 5. 
Yugi activates the effect of his Valkyrion. By tributing itself, it summons all three Magna Warriors from the Grave to the Field. Upon each of their summons, Slifer's effect kicks in, attempting to reduce the defense of all three by 2000. This is where Yugi reveals his Magnet Force. Now, until the end phase, any Rock-type monster, targeted by an effect, can now be redirected to any other monster of the owner's choice. All three effects are redirected back at the gods, reducing their attack instead of the Magna Warriors. Could this be another shenanigan? Yes. This one is literally moving the effect to something else now, but I guess it's not targeting, and maybe the Egyptian gods just specifically can't be targeted, so it's fine. Now, with all the monsters weakened, Silent Swordsman attacks Obelisk. Atem activates his face-down Mirror Force to destroy all of Yugi's monsters. However, this is exactly what Yugi wanted. Yugi plays Magnet Reverse, this allows him to special summon Valkyrie on the Magna Warrior back to the field in face of defense. The effect of Atem's Slide for the Sky Dragon activates again, however yet again the effect is returned. And now since Obelisk's attack is zero, it is destroyed. Yugi moves into his main phase too. He uses the effect of Valkyrion to summon Alpha, Beta, and Gamma back to the field. Slifer's effect triggers once again, and yet again the effects bounce back. Both Slifer and Ra's attack go down to zero, and as a result, both are destroyed. Yugi ends his turn. It's Atem's turn, and he draws Polymerization. He activates it and fuses his Gazelle and Berthamet together to make Chimera the Flying Mythical Beast. Since this isn't Battle City rules, Atem is able to attack the same turn he fusion summoned. He destroys Yugi's Alpha and ends his turn. It's back to Yugi, and he draws Buster Blader. He sacrifices Beta and Gamma to summon it. With this being the only card in his possession, his only option is to attack and destroy Chimera. The attack succeeds, and Yugi inflicts damage to Atem for the first time in the duel. Chimera's effect then activates, special summoning Berthamet from the grave. Yugi ends his turn. It's Atem's turn, and he draws Beast of Gilfer. He sacrifices his Berthamet and summons Beast of Gilfer into face up defense. He sets Book of Secret Arts face down and ends his turn. Could he have summoned Gilfer into face down defense? Yes. Would that have been the better play? Yes. Did he do it? No. It's Yugi's turn and he draws Soul Rope. He sets it face down and then moves into his battle phase. He attacks Beast of Gilfer. It is destroyed, however its effect reduces the attack of Buster Blader. Yugi ends his turn. It attempts move and he draws Awakening from Beyond. He activates it, which allows him to add one monster from his grave by letting Yugi draw two cards. Yugi draws Spell Textbook and Gandora the Dragon of Destruction, while Atem adds Swift Gaia the Fierce Knight, a card that he had discarded on the first turn. It turns out that Atem had always planned for Yugi to defeat the Egyptian God cards, so on his very first move, he planned for that eventuality by discarding a very powerful card. Now with an empty field, Atem summons Gaia without a sacrifice. He uses it to attack and destroy Buster Blader. However, as this happens, Yugi activates his Soul Rope. Since one of his monsters was destroyed, by paying 1000 life points, he can special summon any level 4 or lower monster from his deck. He chooses Witch of the Black Forest. Atem ends his turn. It's Yugi's turn and he draws Summon Skull. He sacrifices Witch of the Black Forest in order to summon it, and then, due to the Witch of the Black Forest's effect, he adds a monster with less than 1500 defense from his deck straight to his hand. Summon Skull then attacks and destroys Swift Gaia. Yugi ends his turn. It's Atem's turn, and now Atem's back is against the wall. If he doesn't get the card he needs, he will lose next turn. From this point onward, Atem has the power to will whatever card he needs to keep him in the duel to the top of his deck. Remember that the Millennium Puzzle's unique ability was that it granted a luck boost in dire situations. So, with Atem wielding this power, he draws Big Shield Gardener, which is just the card he needed to keep him in this duel for another turn. Are there better cards that he could have willed to the top of the deck to perhaps put him in an advantageous position? Yes. So why didn't he get those? Well, that's because that's not how this ability works. Imagine out of your entire deck, you know that there's six cards that can keep you in the duel this turn. You don't get to pick one of them specifically. It's kind of you get one of those cards at random. However, the more desperate the situation becomes, the more that power sort of focuses in. He's not super desperate right now. So that's why I got Big Shield Garner. It's Yugi's turn and he draws 
Pot of Greed. He activates it straight away and draws two new cards, Watapan and Curse of Dragon. Due to Watapan's effect, since it was added to his hand, it special summons itself. Yugi then sacrifices it to summon Curse of Dragon. Knowing Big Shield Gardener's effect well, Yugi attacks into it with Summon Skull. He takes 100 damage, however Big Shield Gardener switches to attack due to its own effect. Curse of Dragon then attacks and deals a huge chunk of damage to a 10, putting him in an even more desperate situation. Yugi ends his turn. It a 10's turn and through his will, Dark Magic Curtain moves to the top of his deck. A 10 pays half of his life points to activate it. He is able to special summon Dark Magician from his deck straight to the field. A 10 then activates his face down Book of Secret Arts. A 10 attacks and destroys Summon's Skull. He ends his turn. It's Yugi's turn and he draws Block Man. Seeing Atem's life points are below 1000, he sets his Marshmallow face down. Now, if Atem attacks into it, he will take 1000 damage and lose the door. Yugi switches his Curse of Dragon into defense and ends his turn. Atem, knowing exactly what that face down monster was, since Yugi showed him when he added it to his hand, he knows if nothing changes, he will lose the duel this turn. So Atem wills Thousand Knives to the top of his deck. He uses it to destroy Yugi's face down Marshmallow to avoid its effect damage. He then attacks and destroys Yugi's Curse of Dragon. Atem ends his turn. It's back to Yugi and he draws Soul Shield. He normal summons Blockman into defense and then sets Soul Shield face down and ends his turn. Seeing Yugi go pure defense, Atem wills Dark Spear to the top of his deck. He equips it to Dark Magician so that it can now deal piercing battle damage. But Yugi plays his trap Soul Shield. By paying half his life points, he can instantly end the battle phase. This works, and Atem is forced to end his turn also. It's Yugi's turn, and he draws Gold Sarcophagus. First, he activates it. By banishing one card from his deck face down, if Atem ever activates or summons the same card as the one chosen, that summoned monster or activated card is negated. Yugi chooses... Monster Reborn. Yugi follows this play by activating the effect of his block man. By tributing it, he can summon one block token for each turn it was on the field. Now with enough materials, he sacrifices both his tokens to summon Gondora, the Dragon of Destruction. He activates its effect at the cost of half his life points. All monsters on the field are now banished. However, before this effect can wipe out Dark Magician, Atem plays his Dark Illusion, which makes Dark Magician unaffected by monster effects and incapable of being destroyed by battle this turn. However, Yugi is allowed to draw one card as a result. Yugi draws Magician's Circle, he sets it and spells Textbook face down and ends his turn. It's Atem's turn and now since it appears he is in a winning position, his luck boost seems to subside. As such, the card he draws is never actually revealed. So assumingly, it was nothing that could have helped him out this turn and possibly it was an unplayable card. So maybe like a, a the ritual spell, but without the ritual monster, something along them lines. With the match within his reach, Atem enters his battle phase and attacks directly. However, Yugi activates his Magician's Circle, which lets both players special summon a spellcaster type monster with less than 2,000 attack from their decks. Yugi summons Silent Magician level zero, while Atem summons Dark Magician Girl. Atem attempts to attack for game again, however Yugi activates Spell Textbook. By discarding all of the cards in his hand, he's allowed to draw one card, and if that card drawn is a spell, he can activate it immediately. Since Yugi has no cards in his hand, he doesn't discard anything, which would have been an illegal play, but luckily the card states, if any. Yugi draws and miraculously gets the spell card of sanctity. Yugi draws six new cards. These six cards are never revealed, nor are they used, nor do they really matter to the story, as he doesn't need them. Atem, sensing the potential for Yugi to make a comeback, draws his five cards and manages to will Monster Reborn to the top of his deck. Alongside this, he also gets Magicians Unite and three other cards that are never actually revealed to us or even played. Assumingly, again, they were dead draws. But to be fair, with the two cards that we know what they are, he thinks he has game with them, so why would he need more cards in his mind, right? The effect of Silent Magician triggers. For every card that Atem drew, Silent Magician moves up a level, and its attack increases by 500. Now, the tables have turned. If Atem's attack is successful, he will be the one to now lose the duel. Atem activates his quick play, Magicians Unite, which merges Dark Magician and Dark Magician Girl together into a single monster with 3000 attack. The boost isn't enough to get over Silent Magician, but it is enough for Atem to stay in the duel. And it is here where we get the final shenanigan 
of the entire duel. Atem activates Monster Reborn to bring back Slifer the Sky Dragon. Since Atem has four cards in his hand, Slifer's attack equals 4,000. Atem's plan is to attack with Slifer for game. However, my dude, to activate Monster Reborn, you had to leave your battle phase, so you don't have any attacks left. And that also means during the end phase, Slifer goes to the graveyard. What's the deal? This is the last time, Konami. This is the last time I fill a plot hole in for you. Perhaps the Battle City rule, normal spell cards can be activated like quick plays during your battle phase or set face down and then they basically become quick play spell cards, has carried over from Battle City into this door. But at the end of the day, who the hell cares if Atem activated Monster Reborn in his battle phase or outside of his battle phase? Because it's about to get negated. Yugi reveals that the card that he had banished was in fact his own Monster Reborn. Atem's Monster Reborn is negated and Slifer returns back into the grave. This play holds two special meanings. Yugi knew the Pharaoh so well, he predicted and planned for this eventuality, solidifying that Yugi really was the true king of games. And it also shows Yugi's resolve to free the Pharaoh's soul, because remember, he was hesitant to lose one of his closest friends. This maneuver is saying to the Pharaoh, the souls of the dead aren't meant to linger in the world of the living. It was Yugi's way of saying goodbye through the duel. Atem, with a proud smile on his face, ends his turn. It's Yugi's turn and the final turn of the duel. He draws, but it doesn't matter what it is, as he simply enters his battle phase and attacks for game. The Pharaoh is defeated. His soul has been set free, and Yugi is now the new king of games. Yugi cries at the loss of his closest companion, the one that helped him grow so much over his journey. Atem leaves for the afterlife with a smile on his face, giving a final thumbs up to everyone that was a part of his life. And I think as well, that thumbs up is also to all of us. He's given us a thumbs up saying thank you for coming on this journey with me. What a beautiful ending to a great series. Now let's dissect the crap out of this door, shall we? Yugi. A champion doesn't belong on his knees. So let's go in reverse of potential ways this duel could have been different. First of all, I want to point out that Atem ends his last turn with four cards in his hand. They're never revealed, nor are they ever set or activated, so it's safe to assume that they were probably unplayable. We have kind of already covered this, but the reason why he didn't will more better cards to his hand to keep the duel going is because he really felt like he had game there. He can't see the future, so he can't predict that Yugi's got Monster Reborn in the box. This is why he only got two cards to help him out rather than an entire hand's worth. In terms of shenanigans throughout the duel, the Monster Reborn thing, uh, it's a bit weird, but we've seen Monster Reborn be activated like a quick play spell in a previous season. So we're gonna let that go with, Atem really did think he had a uh, game and had Yugi not been able to stop Monster Reborn, then yeah, he he would have won. On top of all this, even if Atem had a couple more plays left, the next turn on Yugi's turn, he has seven cards that we don't know what they are in his hand. So he potentially could keep going in the duel. So he might have more plays still available if the duel like had to continue. However, I will say it's lucky that Atem didn't have a Karibo during that final attack. That would have been a bit embarrassing. Yugi goes for the attack, tears in his eyes. Oh, Oh, Karibo. I thought he was going to summon another monster. I thought he was going to attack me twice. I'm surprised Karibo never made an appearance for this whole duel. It's weird, really, isn't it? Could Atem have stolen victory earlier? Well, we did discuss the whole Pot of Greed fiasco. Had he activated that in his main phase one, he would have drawn two more cards. His Slifer's attack would have been 4,000. He would have tried to attack over Silent Swordsman. Yugi would have had to have used his face down card to boost his monster attack to 4,000. Both would have destroyed each other. Atem can then attack the two remaining gadget monsters and then attack directly with Jack's Knight, which still has an attack. He would have won that way, and then he still had a, almost the Tormentor, which I don't think could attack. Could have won all the way back there. So Atem did have gain, but he never capitalized on it, so he misplayed real hard back then. And also, fun fact, if you remember me talking about activating Card of Sanctity during the first turn, which could have completely changed this entire duel. He would have got Obelisk out super early, and he would also have had a face down Mirror Force. So potentially, Atem could have won 
like within the first 10 turns or something like that because it would have just been like a snowball effect. Might as well quickly bring it up one more time. Obelisk couldn't use its tribute to Monster's ability to deal 4,000 damage to the opponent. That was because Yugi's card negated his effect and he never had an opportunity to use that and then when it was negated that's when the monsters were on the field. So that's why Yugi never won via that. So overall who do I think won this duel? I do think it was Yugi. A 10 could have 100% won this duel much earlier on, but he didn't capitalize on it, so it's his own fault really. But in the grand scheme of things, Yugi came more prepared to this duel. A 10 planned for Yugi defeating the Egyptian gods, and then he planned to beat Yugi, whereas Yugi planned to defeat the Egyptian gods and then defeat the Pharaoh. He had planned that far ahead. So I think Yugi, without a doubt, is the true king of games.